I'm Bryden. Um, I'm a postdoc in the Ralstonia Phage project at the University of York, and I'm just kind of going to give you a, a crash course in uh, um, Ralstonia serum, which is our chosen pathogen. Um, so Ralstonia serum is a beta poachia bacterium. It's soil-borne gram-negative phytopathogen, and it has a bipartite genome whereby genes associated with virulence can be found on um, both the chromosome and on the megaplasmid. Um, um, it's the causative agent of bacterial wilt disease. And it has a wide host range and can affect over 250 plant hosts in over 54 plant families. Um, it infects solanaceous plants such as tomato and potato, but it can also infect uh, fruit crops such as banana and oilseed crops. And it can also infect uh, secondary hosts which are asymptomatic such as Solanum dulcamara or uh, woody nightshade. Um, it's, can be very, um, it can persist for long periods in the soil and in more temperate regions can also persist for long times in river water. So um, bacteria, with this bacterial wilt disease it produces these wilt-like symptoms and the plant will then subsequently die. Um, so probably not surprising from the large number of hosts that it can infect, but uh, Ralstonia um, can, is a, has a global distribution and it's found in both temperate and hotter Mediterranean type regions. So yeah, if it's a, a yellow dot, then it's present in, uh, in the countries. And if it's a purple dot, then it's a uh, transient there. Um, so uh, Ralstonia solanosterum also has a very large genetic diversity, and this has been categorized into a species complex consisting of four phylotypes, uh, which can be evolutionarily traced back to different continents. Um, this genetic diversity has been even further reclassified now into three um, different Ralstonia species, so Ralstonia sicidii, Pseudosolanosterum, and Solanosterum. Uh, in the UK, there's predominantly phylotype 2B strains, um, and these are the group of strains which commonly infect potato and tomato. So how much of a problem is Ralstonia solanosterum for causing bacterial um, wilt disease? Um, Ralstonia solanosterum was listed as the second most destructive plant pathogenic bacteria. Uh, and just in terms of, just if we look at potato production, it can affect 3.75 million acres uh, across 80 countries worldwide. Um, Ralstonia is difficult to uh, control because of the fact that it can grow endophytically and survive in the soil and in temperate regions travel in water. It has a high genetic and phenotypic diversity and this dramatically increases the um, difficulties for its sustainable control because it can infect so many different types of hosts. And these um, factors in combination can cause serious economic consequences around the world, particularly in countries like China or in Indonesian areas. And if we just look at um, tomato and potato, um, previous research has shown anywhere between for tomato having yield losses of between zero to 91% or potato having uh, 33 to 90% yield losses. Um, the monetary losses um, to the agricultural economy can be immense due to the high value of these crops. So in the US alone, these industries are valued at $1.67 billion for tomato and $3.7 billion for potato. So not only is there substantial yield losses, but also monetary losses as a result of this disease. Um, just in terms of the Ralstonia and its life cycle, from a probably more biased UK temperate point of view, um, Ralstonia survives, as I said, in the soil for years and also in river waters, and it can overwinter in secondary hosts such as Solanum dulcamara. Um, and in this survival stage, it has the ability to retain pathogenicity genes even in the absence of a host plant. So that makes then, when it comes to infection, it can infect the hosts from the soil after years of just being present in the soil without a host. Um, and I'll go into the infection in the next couple of slides, more, the more mechanistic side, um, but essentially they can infect the host, cause bacterial wilt disease and the plant will die. And they, the bacteria can then recolonize the soil from the dead plant. And their dispersal is quite effective. So they can be dispersed to other crops from um, uh, contaminated seeds or propagation materials or through things like um, contaminated farming equipment. So it is quite a problem. 
Um, so then just in terms of like infection, the more mechanistic side of how it works, um, Ralstone is present in the soil and it's able to locate the plant root by chemotaxing towards the root with flagella motility. And it's able to attach to the root by, via both reversible and irreversible mechanisms uh, using polysaccharides, adhesin proteins and type 4 pili. And the natural root entry into the plant is via wounds or natural openings. Uh, of course, the plant is not like an <laughs> unresponsive bystander in all of this. They also react to the invasion of the Ralstonia. So plants can use recognition receptors to detect surface localized pathogen associated molecular patterns, such as flagellin proteins or lipopolysaccharides. And this activates the pattern triggered immunity in the plant to um, activate antimicrobial response to reduce pathogen growth. Um, but then uh, Ralstonia are able to kind of avoid this recognition because um, um, their flagellin protein can have uh, can be polymorphic. So um, then it can be under not be detected by its host and can avoid recognition in this way. Um, the Ralstonia are also able to inject type three secretion system effector proteins um, to further suppress plant immunity. And the plant can also um, recognize these effector proteins and try to then um, trigger effect triggered immunity to reduce pathogen growth um, but we know that Ralstonia are also able to produce even more effector proteins which can further suppress this uh, or subvert these um, immunity responses by the plant further and then further facilitating their um, host colonization. Um, and Ralstonia have a really high number of uh, effector proteins to about 70 have been identified, um, which is very high because I, th I think usually it's around 40 on average is the, probably the highest level of um, type 3 secretion effector proteins that bacteria have. So it's, uh, it's quite high and this is probably because of their large host range. Um, so uh, as I said, Ralstonia then, once they've infected the root, they're able to migrate to the xylem vessels um, and um, they uh, basically repress their flagella motility and switch to a twitching motility to reach the xylem vessel. Um, and um, for bacterial wilt disease, for the virulence, it's very dependent on um, expression of virulence factors, including this like switch of cell motility, um, production of extra polysaccharides and type three secretion effectors. Um, and these, these um, virulence factors are regulated predominantly by something called a PHC quorum sensing system. Um, and this acts whereby when cells are in low density, such as in the soil, there's um, a small little functioning quorum sensing molecules, when, which causes um, a low virulence phenotype. Whereas when plants, are when um, the bacteria are present in the xylem vessels, for example, they've got much higher cell densities. So there's a much more abundant accumulation of quorum sensing molecules. And this regulates the production of virulence factors um, and suppresses the survival invasion factors that would have happened in the soil. So, and it really helps switch to uh, more virulent phenotypes. So uh, once the Ralstonia are in the xylem, they um, grow to high cell densities and they produce a lot of exopolysaccharides um, which block the water flow in the xylem. And this causes the classic wilting symptoms observed for the disease. Uh, there are other contributors to wilting as well. So other studies have shown that, um, that plants can, as an immune response, produce tyloses, which blocks the migration of the bacteria further up the xylem vessels. Um, plants and bacteria can also produce plant cell wall degrading enzymes, which then also contribute to their higher densities. Um, and then subsequently, yeah, they, the, bacteria, the uh, plant will die. <laughs> um, but obviously there's not just the interaction between the pathogen and the plant. Uh, the pathogen also interacts with um, the native rhizosphere microbial community before um, it enters the plant. So um, there can be a lot of direct microbial competition within the rhizosphere, which can also influence the virulence and invasion capabilities of Ralstonia salamisterum. Um, and interactions between the 
um, the pathogen and the native uh, rhizosphere community can involve some kind of the things like direct interactions, such as secretion of antimicrobial compounds against Ralstonia. And that there can also be indirect interactions, such as competition for resources like nutrients or niche space. And these interactions can then also be further shaped by plant development stages or abiotic environmental conditions. Um, however, Ralstonia has been shown to be able to disrupt these native uh, rhizosphere communities um, and reduce their diversity and their function and the abundance of non-pathogenic bacteria, which uh, makes it easier for them to infect the plant. Um, so what are the current disease treatments or what's been used before? So there's quite a wide diversity of treatments that have been uh, used. Uh, for example, crop rotations have been used in the past, um, but these weren't necessarily uh, that effective because of the wide host range that Ralstonia salarum serum has and the fact that it's um, able to persist in the soil for many years. Um, there's also been resistant cultivars produced and these are very effective. Um, I guess the, the one downside of these are that um, to enable to have the resistance, uh, plants have, pro have actually been not reduced, have not uh, produced as good yields or quality. Um, there's also been chemical methods used, but for obvious reasons like um, pesticides and bactericides, there's a, um, there is potential concern over its long lasting effects on the ecological, other ecological systems. Um, and then um, I guess more, more recently, there's been um, biocontrol methods, which have become a lot more popular. Um, and these for Ralstonia slanshirum, it's more been um, bacterial biocontrol, so using Bacillus or Pseudomonas species to produce antimicrobial compounds against Ralstonia or um, competing for um, nutrients and space. So uh, as my last slide, just to kind of go a bit further with this biocontrol method, and um, that's what our project is um, hoping to do, except we're using phages or uh, bacterial viruses instead of bacteria. Um, as lytic phages have been regarded as one of the most promising alternatives for controlling pathogenic bacteria, largely because they do not disturb larger ecological systems and um, they're self-replicating and self-limiting. So they're only target um, the, the pathogen of interest and then once that's no longer there they, they are self-limiting so they don't replicate anymore um, and also if bacteria are able to form resistance which is often seen the case with um, different types of biocontrol and um, this resistance that the bacteria have or evolve against phages can often be at the cost of their virulence capacity so they can become less virulent to the plant as a result of becoming resistant to the phage so we're hoping to try and find and um, make like a cocktail of lytic phages to target against different strains of Ralstonia. And we're looking at phages from different diverse environments that have different host specificities and that have different mechanisms um, of infection. And with that, thank you for listening and I welcome any questions that you have.